All right. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Ministry Revealed. It is February 16th, 2022. And as promised, today is going to be a video that is revealing, that is all encompassing, and is a remake of sorts, if you can say, of a video that is part of our intro series. I'll, I'll show it here again in a moment. Um, called The Differences and the Truth. This is an updated one, not because the information that was in it was wrong, but because so much more in the last two and a half years since that video has come to be revealed that we can make it a greater picture of why these revelations are so important, but how did it happen? What, 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 how did it get missed? Okay. And these are the things that we're going to cover today. As I said, this was the video I'm going to call this one. It's all because of Matthew, as you guys will see from the title of this video and the video it's replacing is this one right here called the differences and the truth. All right. It's not replacing it, like I said, because it's bad or anything like that. It's just going to have so much more info. All right. So let's uh, let's start getting into this and start explaining this and and show you what it is that we're going to get into and what this is all about. <clears throat> so for anybody that's new, I we talk about this. I talk about this at every single video. And that is from this playlist here, because you're going to hear things that you've never heard before, that you've never understood, and you're going to be scratching your head when when you hear things like who the Gospels are speaking to, or you or you hear things like 14 years when all your life you've been told it's seven years of the tribulation. You're gonna you're gonna scratch your head on all these things. So you need to click on the playlist and then go to the one called the Revealed End Time Study Note series. We always start by introducing these two intro videos. This one right here, they both, one and two, each have six pages in the study notes that you can get in the description box under the video. And you can read along, you can make notes with it. Once you've begun to understand this revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to, and then you watch this second intro video, an hour out of your life, two 30-minute videos, and begin to grasp the understanding that follows the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to and realize that the truth is two sets of seven years because not only is there one seven that relates to Matthew, there is one seven that also relates to the Gospel of Mark. And that's the key. That is what has been missed. And it all comes down to the very first video, who the Gospels are speaking to. This is something that has been known but not understood for centuries, that the, that the Gospel of Matthew is to the Jews, that the Gospel of Mark seems to be to, to a Gentile group, and then Luke, there's something going on Gentile-related. But it was never understood as it's been revealed in this ministry, and you will begin to understand it in this first intro video. And when you do, and you start to understand the second video, which is that there are two sets of sevens to come, you're going to say, oh my goodness. But here's the thing to remember. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing because it means the pre-trib is coming sooner than if it was only seven years. Because it is true that it's still pre-trib. You're going to find out that there's also a mid-trib and that there's also a, a post-trib. And that's what we're going to get into as we get this all started. So after having watched the first two intro videos and beginning to understand these revelations of the Gospels and of the years for the end of days, the next question that generally follows is always, or is generally almost always, how 
was this missed? Okay, we're going to cover that today and use this question to show how much more it actually all reveals. And the answers it reveals are absolutely incredible. They become very clear, just maybe not to everyone at first. And the reason I say that is because the many questions it helps to answer are not always, or sorry, are yeah, are not always the very deeply ingrained ones which we were taught in church over the generations, regardless of which generation you might come from. These questions that begin to be answered are some of the very questions that have separated those same denominations and that have caused divisions within churches. So you can understand why it will cause many to at first gasp along the way. All right? <clears throat> because I assure you, as you continue to seek these out, you're going to say, oh, my goodness, that helps answer this. That helps answer that. Oh, that's why this said it in that gospel and this said it differently in another gospel. All of these questions, all of these things that how is it all going to fit in seven years? And, and you always had these questions in pre, mid and post. As you seek these things for yourself, you will come to see all of it. And when I say all, I literally mean all. This is going to go from the beginning. We're going to go from Genesis 1-1 and even cover parts right into the book of Revelation. This is how, how incredibly awesome this understanding is and what these two open and reveal as to why it was never seen or understood before. You see, I used to think maybe it was the church's fault. You know, maybe it was the seminary schools that taught them. You know, I used to think a couple years ago in doing this video that that maybe these things were 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 purposely hidden. You know, the enemy was trying to cause confusion. And I've since over the last couple of years or so realized that that's not at all the case. That what it is, is that it was the Father's perfect timing. And that what they've been teaching from are eyes, all the pastors, everybody that's, that's teaching now has been teaching from eyes that see in what I call the is. There's the was which is the Old Testament. There's the is, which is from Christ until the day of the pre-trib escape, the, the pre-trib like a rapture. And then there is the is to come. And so what's happening is they're trying to show the is to come, but they're doing it with eyes that are in the is. And this is what has caused the confusion from things like the discrepancies within the Gospels, as I mentioned earlier, um, to only seeing seven years of tribulation. Well, people have had questions about how does it all fit and, and how can it be seven years and, and, and Ezekiel 39 say that they're burning weapons for seven years. You know, a lot of these questions that, that we've all had, how were these things possible? How, how, how was it that it was only seven? And not only only seven years of trib, because you see, that is that is what this ministry is. It's it's the revealing. It's the revelation. It's the opening of the books for the end of days. You see, but what happens is in revealing the is to come. It also brings us back to the beginning because the end reveals the beginning. And what we've recently, in the last couple, three months, come to, to be revealed is that the very same reason that the entirety of the church sees a seven-year portion of time for the end of days is the exact same reason they see that everything from creation is only going to be the 6,000th to the 7,000th year with the millennial reign. These are the things that we're going to talk about today 
and even some heavier things like how we're told that antichrist and satan are the same they're they're the same at this same period of time yet when we go to the book of revelation in chapter 16 we see that it shows all three the two of them with the false prophet as well but then we even have more than that <clears throat> we have something that has caused great debate within churches and it has caused a lot of separation and that is the the teaching that is believed that christ is also the father okay these answers as heavy and as deep and as as mysterious or or almost unanswerable some people might say that some of these are we know that some churches see it this way we know that others see that him is the father and we see some see it another way and some in all of these different ways because of all the denominations the reason for each and every single one of them is because of the lens that each of them is looking through they're looking through a lens yet as they look through this lens they're reading scripture through this lens and this lens is it isn't focused when they're when they're reading other pieces of scripture when they read something that that's pre pre-trib for example pre-trib rapture or a mid-trib rapture or, or or a post-trib when the lord returns they could read these things in scripture but the lens that they're looking through doesn't jive it just doesn't focus in properly that is the reason for it all for the seven years for the pre mid and post for the seven thousand years for antichrist and satan for for jesus and the father all of these things come down to the same root source and that my brothers and sisters is matthew 24 matthew 24 matthew 24 matthew 24 on and on and on and on in prophecy it is all because of the lens of matthew 24 and in all of scripture it is the overall lens of matthew in his entire gospel in general do you guys understand what i'm getting at the the lens of being taught generation after generation after generation from the gospel of matthew has given the entirety of the church the eyes of judah do you understand that when you've begun as i said to understand the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to the synoptic gospels of matthew mark and luke and you realize in the end of days it's going to be luke mark and matthew you will begin to grasp all of this piece by piece because this this matthew lens is not a church lens it's not the house of israel lens it is the house of judah lens it has always been the house of judah lens we have been taught as i've said as you guys know we have been taught all our lives that matthew is to the jews yet all of our lives we've been taught from a foundation in the gospel of matthew and that's because when you're in the is okay not the was not the is to come but you're in the is of which we're living right now what the church tells you is that it doesn't really matter the gospel they focus on matthew because that's the first one there 
and they use Mark and they use Luke in the synoptics and John, and they build the story of what took place. And they will say it was different perspectives. But Luke wasn't there. Right? Or you get stories like like these discrepancies where people would say, well, why did Luke, in Luke's gospel, Jesus says he would be like Jonah was, that he would he would be the warning as Jonah was, so shall the Son of Man be. And we know that that's the 40 days. It was prophetic, by the way. That's still an is-to-come thing. And when you go to Matthew's gospel, in Matthew it said he would be like Jonah was in the belly of the, of the whale for three days and three nights. He would be in the earth. Yet, when you go to the gospel of, of Mark, it says, no sign will be given to this generation, and he got in the ship and he left. These are discrepancies. Uh, this is an example of a discrepancy that cannot be explained by just saying, in the is that we're living in, we're, we're, we're looking from Matthew and then we're adding Mark and Luke and John, and, and we're adding the perspective to finish the picture. There are many instances that, that are called discrepancies because they don't actually help complete the picture. They're incomplete images. They're, they're incomplete and they're discrepancies. So it must mean that there was something else within these Gospels that was going on. It must mean that there was a reason why the Lord just didn't say, hey, we've got three synoptic Gospels. Is it really necessary that Luke wrote another one? Is it really necessary that even Mark bothered? Hey, let's just have Matthew's Gospel and put the whole story into one. There's a reason that didn't happen. They could say, oh, it was to preserve the word better. No, because they were all different points of view. You see, they, they, you had to use them all. But if they were all in one, why would you have to bother building up pieces from the other ones? When you realize that with these discrepancies, you realize there was a purpose and a reason for the synoptic gospels repeating stories in different ways. And the answer to that is found, the beginning of your understanding is found in that first intro video of who the Gospels are speaking to. But what we're focusing on now in this third portion, if you will, because it's going to replace the differences in the truth, what we're going to talk about is this, is this seven-year imagery, this 7,000-year idea. And it's going to bring us into some very heavy things. You see, when, when the focus of the lens of everything being seen is being seen through a lens of the Gospel of Matthew, then they're seeing through the eyes of the house of Judah. You're seeing through the eyes of the house of Judah. The house of Judah isn't the church. The house of Judah isn't the house of Israel. The house of Israel is the world. We all know that the Gentiles got grafted in because, because the, the house of Israel scattered throughout the world. Which means if the house of Israel is not the house of Judah, and the house of Judah is the gospel of Matthew written to the Jews, then that lens we're looking through isn't for the church, isn't for the bride, but is specific in particular in its end days application, is specific to a period of time for the house of Judah. But that begs the question then, what is Mark's for and what is Luke's for? And that is the revelation that opens it all up. Let me show you. 
the reason the church believes in a seven years tribulation is the same reason they believe in a 7,000 year of creation. We all believed it. We all believe the creation. You see, because what has happened? They've taken the synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, and they made all three of them one perspective. You see, they've taken all three and tied a bow around them and said, if we look through all three, we've got the perspective of the story. They're doing it in the is time frame, but in the is to come, that's not it at all. Because they're doing it with this foundation of Matthew building the other two into it. They've done the same thing. You'll see when we go a little bit later on and go into the creation, you're going to see they did the exact same thing with the creation story. They've taken these days, first day, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven days. And then they say from the creation of Adam that that was back on the sixth day. You see, if you're looking at the story from a perspective of the house of Judah, then everything you're seeing is a single set of seven. It's being all grouped together as one set of seven years or as one set of 7,000 years. But when you begin to see the Gospels in their separate form on who they're speaking to, you will then begin, as this develops here, to see the creation story in the three separate groups. Because the end of days revelation, I'm going to throw it out there now to even those who are new listening to this, is the revelation that we've been talking about here in this ministry for a long time now. You see, it's kind of tricky. We've been doing this now for four and a half years, and I'm rebuilding or redoing an advanced version of a video from two and a half years ago while trying to place it within that same time frame. All right. But we know so much more now. And and what this is all about, what I'm getting at is that the end of days is really the story of 21 years. It is is a, a mysterious short period of time that flew by like days for Luke's group. And then there's going to be a seven year period of time for Mark's group and a seven year period of time for Matthew's group. You see, that's why the church sees only seven years, because it's as if they're the at the end of Mark's gospel. And if you're at the end of Mark's gospel and everything you've learned is Matthew, but you believe in a pre-trib, then it's as if you're at the end of Mark and the rapture of the great multitude takes place. And when that rapture takes place of the whole church, then what's left? Matthew. You see, but what they failed to understand was that Mark himself doesn't have a discourse to tell us that it's just another visual adding in, piecing it together from Matthew, but that it is actually a separate period of time for the church, which is called the world, which is called the sleeping church, which, which hasn't fully prepared themselves and sold out to the Lord. This is, this is something that's hard to swallow for people at first. But what I always say is that if you're watching videos like this, if you're seeking his understanding, if you're seeking truth, if you're seeking his revelation, if you're, if you love him, and, and you're repentant, and you're drawing diligently closer to him, then don't fear. It makes no difference whether it was 50 years of tribulation, because the pre-trib is also true. All right? So let me show you this difference now. Let me, let me get into this a bit more in relation to this 
pre, mid, and post, and, and go into these things with the, the discourses of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You see, when the whole world of church, now here's the other thing. I say the whole world of church because the whole world of church teaches from this foundation, regardless of what they're teaching. The foundation is always through this lens of the gospel of Matthew, whether they are aware of it or not, it influences everything else they're reading in the New Testament. Or even, you can say even in the Old Testament, but in particular, in understanding, you know, pre, mid, and post going forward. But it's always this lens of Matthew. So, so those that don't talk about prophecy, which is at least 90% of the church, for them, it's it's still the gospel of Matthew that, that's the main focus and foundation of everything, and the others added on. But for those that teach on prophecy, of which maybe 10% of churches worldwide teach on prophecy because the rest are too afraid and don't understand it, what happens is they still do the same thing. They still go from the foundation of Matthew in his discourse because all of their foundation in all of their teachings is still in Matthew. And so here's what happens. <clears throat> we come to Matthew's discourse. And we read things like, um, watch this. Let's go to a, a key place. Right here. In Matthew 24, verse 29. It's like a, I feel like a broken record. I, I'm, I don't even say, you know, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. I mean, it's used so often. It's, a, it's, it's almost like a cliche, you know, in this ministry, we kind of chuckle a bit about it because when you, when you understand these things, you just say, as soon as you hear somebody say, okay, let's go to Matthew 24. You're like, oh no, you know, just time, time to change the channel. So here's the thing. You see, this is what they'll read. They'll say, ah, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven unto the other. You see, this is what they'll tell you when reading this. They'll say, see? This is the pre-trib. They're going to say, and then they'll skip down here and they'll say, but of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the son of man be. And they'll, they'll quote and they'll talk about as in the days of Noah. And they'll, they'll tell you, see, we, we're in the days of Noah. Everything's getting worse and worse. Well, we might seem like we're kind of in the days of Noah, but this specific days of Noah, no, we are not. This specific days of Noah is much worse than what the church thinks when they're reading this. Because when the church is reading this, like I said, they're doing it in eyes that are in the is. Okay? So they're doing it with the perspective of, of how life has been for the last 2,000 years. This is not talking about the time that's about to begin. Noah's days is about a one-year period of time. And what you begin to understand is that this revelation that we're talking about with, with that second intro video, when you see that it's not one set of seven, but two sets of seven years, you realize that there's the seven years for seals and that this seven year period of time for seals of which the great multitude rapture happens in that seventh year, that's the great multitude rapture of the church. And it has nothing to do with this. This has to do with the seventh year of trumpets when the Lord is returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. Because the days of Noah that are being spoken about, there were giants in the land in those days. You see, this is going to be a crazy period of time on the earth 
and it is the final 14th year of trumpets the final 14th year of tribulation the seventh year of trumpets at the lord's return that he will fulfill in jerusalem that he will he will take care against all of those who came against jerusalem this is where this days of noah are what's been missed and what they what they like to read over is this right here immediately after the tribulation of those days well hello that's something that everybody should question how could we be talking about then shall they see the sign of the son of man coming we're going to see him coming in the clouds but it says immediately after the tribulation of those days that's another head scratcher isn't it you see so what they'll do is they take these portions of scripture and they'll tell you that this is pre-trib that that we're not going to experience all of these things in matthew's discourse because it's a pre-trib escaping of these things or or a pre-trib rapture of these things and that it's going to be the whole church not a portion of the church now you see there's obviously some serious discrepancies with this because it's immediately after the tribulation of those days so what they do is they'll say well we know it's pre-trib we know there's a pre-trib so this this rapture that's going to happen that we see in other scriptures is going to happen before this tribulation of matthew 24 even begins and so they'll say see yeah we know that matthew is to the jews and that the church is removed first well here's the thing in a seven-year thinking that is correct in a seven-year thinking this is the seven years to the house of judah it is as if they were at the end of mark's gospel but do you know what happens before the end of mark's gospel mark's discourse there's a reason why mark's discourse has different wording where it has things like famines and troubles which means a roiling of water and yet matthews talks about pestilences there's there's a reason why the abomination of desolation in matthew says standing in the holy place whereas marks says standing where it ought not okay we have other things like um the coming of the son of man the sun uh shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light uh we come to verse 26 of mark 13 and then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds with power and great glory and you see this word in literally means the word in but when we go back to this story the the discourse in matthew chapter 24 and we go to this story of christ when he's coming when the son of man is coming we see the son of man coming in the clouds it's not the word in it's the word on whoa that instantly has to have you start questioning and start scratching your head a little bit and saying well wait a second this is in so this is clearly at the end when the whole world is going to see him but in mark it's the word in and not on that that's a cause for for question that's a cause to say well wait a second if it's in and not on then this isn't the whole world that's going to see him and it's plural with the word clouds you see that's why a program like esword is so important in using the kjv plus so you can get all the word definitions like this it's very very important this is a key to opening the end time scriptures and to be able to understand them you see listen to what it says in in 1327 it says in mark 13 27 after seeing him coming in the clouds 
it says, and then shall he send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds and from the uttermost part of earth and the uttermost part of heaven. Again, what do we have? The four winds. The four winds, this is very different than what we read in Matthew's gospel and in his, and in his discourse. And what you see is, again, this story is very different that follows. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is a man taking a far journey and left his house in the authority of his servants. You see, there is nothing here in relation to the days of Noah. So you see, this is one of those things that, that would be as a, as a discrepancy, but they will put it over the Matthew one and just say, it's, a, it's another perspective to say, always be watching and praying. Well, hold on a second. If it's just a layer over Matthew, and Matthew was actually talking about the end of the tribulation, that one year with the day of Noah, what on earth are you watching to be saved from, from the day of Noah, when this is saying, watch and pray, you will have already gone through tribulation. You see, all of these things that if there are many of you, if not all of you, because you're watching, that have had questions about these things, that have seen these, these discrepancies or these differences and said, well, well, how is that to just be layered over with the other part? The answer is, it's not. It's a completely separate period of time. This discourse being spoken about in Mark is the seven years of seals portion, which is to the church, the sleeping church that is left behind. You'll notice some of these things when you watch that first intro video about the Gospels. You'll see things like when Christ was on the cross in Matthew, as he was going to the cross, he was arrayed in scarlet. In Mark, he was arrayed in purple. In Luke, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means bright, radiant, gay, happy, all those things. Three very different colors. What, did they, did they separate the colors and each of them only saw that one? You see, that's a discrepancy. But when you separate the understanding in this revelation, you understand that the bride is dressed in white, that Mark in purple and Matthew in scarlet are tribulation colors. And it's, it's hard to accept when, when people from the church are just coming into this understanding. You see, but what I, like I said earlier, what I always encourage is that, hey, if you're ready and you're watching and you're praying and you're seeking, you love the Lord, it, it's okay. You'll be part of the bride of Christ portion. You see, if we take it a step further now and we go to Luke's discourse, you're going to see some very important pieces of scripture. Because when we read, when you read in uh, Mark's gospel, it says it'll be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And when you see that, that is the beginning of the tribulation. But in Luke's, it says, then he said unto them, it'll be nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom and all of these things taking place that will follow. And then he says, but before all these things. So this means that Luke's portion is this piece of time that's before this portion right here, which begins Mark's portion of nation against nation. And as you come down and you read it a little bit further, we have videos on this. Um, as, you, as you continue on and you go into um, more of this intro series, you'll see things like the 40 days of the Son of Man. You'll see videos like pre, mid, and post. Um, you'll see things like the tribulation, the coming tribulation seen as never before. This is the, the book of Revelation from chapter 6 to chapter 13, 14. You'll see the discourses, Luke, Mark, and Matthew, understood as they have never been seen and understood before. And so 
what you come to understand is, is the portion of time here in Luke is a very short period of time. But there's much more to it because you'll notice that there's also no uh, uh, as we read in Daniel. Okay? There's no standing where it ought not. It's just Jerusalem that's about to be surrounded and attacked and destroyed. Attacked and destroyed? You see, that's not something you're going to hear in relation to seven years teachings. And we're going to talk on this a little bit more because in, in seven years, they're seeing the perspective of Judah, remember? So they're expecting that, hey, 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 the, the temple's not going to be rebuilt yet. Uh, but once the temple starts, then we know that the, the seven years have begun. And in the midst of those seven years, about three and a half years in, that's when Antichrist is going to step in. That's what they tell us. Okay, Antichrist was here at first, but but he's going to be the one that kind of is the one overseeing and building it. He's going to seem like a good guy. That's what they would tell us. But that's because they've twisted everything they've understood about the end of days and they shoved it all into a single seven year point of view of Matthew. Whereas this here is clearly different than Matthew, different clearly than Mark's. And it says what? Let's keep reading. Then it says, here in verse uh, verse 27, Luke 21, 27, Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. This is way different than Mark, way different than Matthew. And it's even different than Mark and Matthew in relation to seeing him coming. It's the same word in, which means in the cloud, whereas Mark's was the same in, but Mark's was plural clouds, whereas Luke's is singular. And the thing that follows isn't him gathering people from the four corners, isn't him uh, sounding the trumpet. It's that it's time to look up for your redemption is at hand. And Luke's is the only one as we come down here where in Mark and in Matthew, it said, watch and pray. Oh, or it said, sorry, it said, um, but of that day and hour knows no man. In, Mar in Luke's, it doesn't say that. It says, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. A word used only twice. So talking about a day that's going to come upon you unawares, if you're what? Caught up in the cares of this life. That's the church. The, the church as a whole, the 90% is caught up in the things of this world. And so they're going to need a wake-up call, which is the tribulation of seals, unfortunately. It is the tribulation of seals and the discourse of Mark, which is the house of Israel which is the 10 tribes that scattered and mingled with Gentiles, which is why the Gentiles are grafted in. They are caught up in the things of this life. Okay? And it's going to be as a snare for all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. But now listen to this. Only Luke's, remember, Mark and Matthew said in this portion said, but of that day and hour knows no man. In Luke's, it's completely different. Luke's is about the pre-trib of the bride of Christ, the sons of God. Bang! Those with the Spirit of God in them that are about to be removed. And listen to what it says. Because Luke's is the only one that tells us before his discourse begins, whereas Mark, it was after that group of tribulation, 
And in Matthew, it was after that group of tribulation that those groups went. You see, in Luke's, it's the only one that is before the discourse portion of even Luke's begins. Because it says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. All what things? All of these things listed right here. All of the Luke discourse. To to be accounted worthy to escape all of this stuff even before it begins. But in Mark's, it was after that tribulation. In Matthew, it was after the tribulation of those days. And what happens to this group? Those who are accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. It's the only one that says that. There's no warning for them. There's no days of Noah for them. They're already taken out. They're taken out before anything starts. And it's the only group that's told they would be. You see? This is why when we talk about pre-trib in this ministry, we call it the pre-trib escape. The, the, you can even say it's like a rapture, we're told. But it's called the pre-trib escape or like a rapture. The, the mark group that happens at the end in that seventh year of seals is the portion that's called the great multitude rapture or the one that you could say is the rapture. And the one in Matthew is when the Lord returns feet down. You see, that's why it was the word in that means on the clouds because that is when the whole world will see him from lightning from one end to the other. And so as we as we continue to go through this, you're going to see that people and their discussions and the, and the debates that have happened as to whether pre, mid, or post are all true, it's clearly all three. And the only way to begin to see it is to remove yourself from that lens of Matthew, and in particularly prophecy-wise, from backing away from the lens of always going to Matthew 24. Let me show you this. You see, where do people get the idea that it's pre-trib? Well, one of the places is the only place when you have understanding, the only place in relation to the discourses where you could say it's pre-trib is Luke's. Because Luke's is the one that says to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You see, so when the church does it with this perspective of Matthew 24, they're assuming that Mark's gospel and and discourse and, and Luke's discourse are just other perspectives of the same thing. So they go to the end of Luke here as if they're going to the end of Matthew and say, see, nobody knows the day and hour But those who are accounted worthy to escape will escape everything that's about to happen pre-trib and stand before the Son of Man. You see, they blend it together as one. But it's completely incorrect. It is completely incorrect. They've simply taken the, the perspective of the is that they're in and not understood the eyes in the understanding of the is to come. And let me show you this and why. Because if if it was true that they were just all melded together and to be seen as one, even in the end of days, then we wouldn't see a pre, a mid, and a post. Let's go look at some more info in relation to pre, like this one here uh, from Luke in his discourse in uh, 21 verse 34. Uh, suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. See, one of the places people love to go to is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, because 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 3, starting in verse 2, says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. 
for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden, you see, there's that second time it's used. It was used once in Luke 21, verse 34, and it's used once again, or the second time in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. And what does it say? For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them, them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So if we go back to Luke's discourse real quick, you're going to see this entire conversation. You've got, you've got the same word. It's going to come upon them uh, if they're caught up in the drunkenness and cares of this life. They're going to be caught unawares. It's going to be upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. But for those who are worthy, they're going to escape, whereas they or them are not going to be found accounted worthy to escape. So when you look at this, you would say, clearly, this is pre-trib, right? Listen to this part. As travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape, okay? It goes on to to not let this day overtake you, uh, um, not let the darkness, uh, that the day should overtake you as a thief. We are not a child. We are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. See, and then we've got watch and be sober. So all of this conversation is connected to the pre-trib escape of what we read in Luke 21. But there's more to it because it says, uh, shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And we all know this one quite well as well. And that is by going to Revelation chapter 12. So we see there appeared a great woman crowned, right? And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth. There it is right there. This is when she's travailing. This is when the travailing begins in Revelation chapter 12, verse 2. So if this is where the travailing begins, and it said that we would be accounted worthy before the travailing, that, that those who, who were ready, those who were watching, those who were sober, that they wouldn't be caught unawares and that everybody that's left on the earth would be caught in this travailing, which is the beginning of tribulation. <clears throat> so now this brings up the question, is that if you believe that the pre-trib of Luke chapter 21 is the pre-trib, uh, sorry, of First Thessalonians chapter 5 is the pre-trib, which is very clear, and this is where the travailing is, then that must mean before this travailing begins, like somewhere right around verse 2 of Revelation 12, at the beginning of it, before this travailing, it must be where the pre-trib takes place. You follow what I'm saying? Because those who are left, who were caught up in the cares of this world, are caught up in the sudden destruction that comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And the travail begins with the woman in travail. It begins in verse 2 of Revelation. So now this brings up another question, doesn't it? Because when you're being taught about pre-trib and through people with a lens of Matthew 24, they always skip these verses and come all the way down here to Revelation 12, verse 5. And they read to you what they believe is the pre-trib. It says, And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up, the harpazo, unto God and to his throne. Well, now this is a discrepancy, isn't it? Because if it's supposed to be before the travailing begins, why is the rapture all the way down here in verse 5, which is after the tribulation of the pain and torture and travail 
which is after the great red dragon and the ten horns and the seven crowns and a third part of the of the tail that that drew the stars to the earth you see all of this is the tribulation of seals but when they teach us down on this they'll tell you this is the rapture and what i keep showing is that this is correct this is the rapture but it is not the pre-trib rapture because the pre-trib rapture had to come before the travailing this travailing so you know is the portion of time of luke's discourse it is only a period of 40 to 50 days well 40 to 43 probably but 40 to 50 days is this portion of travailing and the bride must be gone in luke's portion that luke discourse was before the travailing begins that lined up perfectly and is a complete match with first thessalonians 5. which means if this pain is the torture and travail and torment which is clearly tribulation and there's a great red dragon in the seven crowns uh, the seven heads and the ten horns and a third of the stars that is clearly the tribulation of seals and the third of the stars is the sixth seal <coughs> when the stars are cast down to the earth so this is telling us that this is not the pre-trib but it is the mid-trib rapture of the great multitude it's the multitude rapture the great multitude rapture and you see this is one of the reasons you know even in um uh, um isaiah 66 verse 7 it tells us that before she travailed she brought forth same thing as thessalonians same thing as luke it's before she travailed but when people read this because of that perspective with matthew and they see the word caught up they think this must be it this is the pre-trib rapture so they they try to explain away what all this is going to be which is the tribulation of seals and you see when people debate pre-trib people they'll go to things like revelation chapter 6 watch this they'll go to things like revelation chapter 6 and you'll see the first the white horse second third fourth rider and then you see the fifth seal and then you get to the sixth seal and when he had opened the sixth seal there was a great earthquake the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth there it is there's your stars falling right like like revelation chapter 12 verse 3 3 or 4. and it says uh even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind okay and it says they're they're hiding in the mountains and then it says uh it said on, they say unto the mountains unto the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and see there's more to the story coming comma and from the wrath of the lamb so there's one that sits on the throne and there's the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come so what are you seeing here you're seeing this is the end of the sixth seal and when i say the tribulation of seals portion is seven years it doesn't mean that it's one year first seal one year the next seal one year the next seal they're going to be mixed and blended one will happen and then there'll be others and they'll mix together but by the end of the sixth year of seals when this happens okay this is when the lord is coming in the mark discourse you see let's go back to this real quick in mark's discourse look at what we see remember what we read about when they see him coming seeing the coming uh, coming of the son of man the stars shall fall you see the stars of heaven shall fall in his discourse when he's coming the stars of heaven were falling in revelation chapter 12 verse 4 i think it was and in the sixth seal you see it's all connected to the same time and then shall they see the son of man coming in 
which is still in the clouds, plural. And listen to what it says. And then shall he send his angels and gather them together, his elect together, from the four winds. From the four winds. Let's go back to Revelation. So now we're we're at the end of Revelation chapter 6, the end of the six years of seals. And we go to the seventh year, or uh, yeah, the beginning of the seventh year. And we see the 144,000 are sealed. And then what do we see? Now we see the great multitude rapture. Great multitude rapture that no man can number. Now, what people want to say is, and the church will read this because you see, this is because it gets so convoluted because everything, it seems, must fit into seven years. So even when things aren't aligning, they, they'll skip over things that they're reading. And they'll tell you that something like this is the great multitude pre-trib rapture. Yet, we just saw that this came after the sixth seal. And if you didn't think that was enough to say, well, it's following in order, all you have to do is go to chapter 8 of Revelation, and it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal. So between the sixth seal ending and the seventh seal beginning, you have the rapture of the great multitude. So clearly, it's the one that comes after the seals. And it's the stars, it's all of those things that are connected. And if we saw, as you saw, in uh, when they see him coming in the clouds, it said what? From the four winds of heaven, right? Well, look at what it says. Look what chapter 7, the beginning of the seventh year of revelation of, of tribulation says. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. Again, another direct connection to Mark's discourse. This is one of the main reasons in Revelation chapter 7 that pre-trib people say, no, the tribulation or or the great multitude rapture isn't pre, it's mid. And they would tell you, they would tell you, there are many that believe this. They'll tell you that it's three and a half years of seals followed by three and a half years of trumpets. So what they'll say is the church will need to remain for the three and a half years of seals, and then it'll be a mid-trib rapture, and then the the temple that will have been built or being built, then the enemy is going to step into it at that point. And this is the group that's, again, they're right in part of their assessment, yet they're still very wrong. because. What their understanding is indeed correct that this rapture of the great multitude is after the six years of seals in that seventh year, but they see it not as as a mid-trib being seven years and seven years, but they see it as the lens of Matthew, and they see it even though, you know, they're, they're still looking through this lens of Matthew. And even though they're seeing mid-trib, with this lens of Matthew, they're still doing it within a seven-year context. And it goes all the way back because of the Gospel of Matthew. So this is something that even myself, I used to bounce back and forth on. Because you would see things that are clearly pre, as we just showed, and you can clearly see things that are mid, like this, when it's between the end of the sixth seal and before the seventh seal is broken. So... Of course, you have to say that there's a mid-trip. But this still doesn't answer for Matthew's gospel. You see? Matthew's gospel, Matthew's discourse, is neither. Is neither mid, nor is it pre. It is not Luke's. 
it is not Mark's. Okay, it is not pre, it is not mid. Matthew's is its own, and there are reasons why we're seeing things, as we read earlier, like immediately after the tribulation of those days. You know, there shall be a sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And then they shall they see them in, which means on, because the whole earth is going to see him coming at this point. We see that it's with a trumpet that he gathers the elect. We see this this as it was in the days of Noah, as I mentioned, is the complete final year when the Lord will have returned after the sixth year of trumpets, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and will destroy all of those who had come against Jerusalem, this is that portion. You see, this relates to the time of what? Of the last trumpet. So what happens is you'll have people, when they read Matthew, they actually have a really good understanding. There were those, um, if I remember correctly, even um, um, uh, 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 Irvin, Irving Baxter, who passed away of COVID, I think, within the last couple of years or a year and a half or so. And he was a post-tribber. And I recently heard from a sister in the ministry who was at a Bible study and said that, that, that the people that she was in the Bible study with teach that it's also post-trib. And so for, for many people, when you're hearing what I'm teaching and you go and listen to something like that, if you're newer, you, you kind of get a little confused and you say, but Man, after everything I saw, I thought it was pre and there's mid and there's post. Why are they saying these things are post? For the exact same reasons, brothers and sisters, they're looking through the lens of Matthew and in particular, Matthew 24. And they're absolutely correct in saying, hey, guys, this son of man coming at this point This is at the end of the tribulation. This is when the whole world is going to see him coming on a cloud or on the clouds. This is not pre-trib. This isn't mid-trib either. This is post-trib. So when people are reading Matthew's discourse and they tell you that, hey, I don't believe in pre or mid, and people go to 1 Thessalonians or they go to Luke or they go to they go to Isaiah or they go to Revelation to chapter 12 at the beginning and they say well what do you mean these are all saying pre and then somebody will say well look at look at Revelation chapter 7 the rapture of the great multitude is clearly after the seals you know before the seventh seal which is a short period of time so how is it that you're sitting here and telling me you know, Irving or these others that Matthew is post. Well, because when you read it for what it says and you just read Matthew and you don't go into these other portions, it's clearly post. It's clearly post. You see, so so when they want to tell you and and debate with you and say, well, okay, well, this kind of seems like it's post, but where else can you show me in scripture? And you know where people go to And they're absolutely right in doing it. They go to 1 Corinthians 15. And they come down here. And they say, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And what does the church tell you? They will all tell you the same thing, that this is the pre-trib rapture of the great multitude. And we wonder why everybody's so confused. It said right here at the last trump, so they'll make up, uh, it's one of the trumpets that, that Moses made, and it's still the last one. And we know there's seals and trumpet judgments. When does everybody raise? 
You see, they all think that this has to do because, because there's a changing of the body from, from corruptible to incorruptible, that it must be the rapture. No, this is the post-trib when the Lord returns at the last trump. Because what happens is the dead that are being raised are those who were promised the millennial reign. You follow? You see, the raised from the dead has nothing to do with the rapture. The raised from the dead is the promise that was given to the Jews. Remember, is it uh, chapter 11 of Romans? Look at what it says. Where do we say? Uh, let's start right here. In Romans 11, verse 7. What then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them a spirit of slumber. We're going to talk about this next. Eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David, you're going to want to remember this one. This is a big, we're going to get into some serious stuff. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. For if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Verse, uh, verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, Who's the world? The house of Israel and the Gentiles. They are one now. They're blended and mixed in throughout the world. And Judah is separate. Judah is trumpets. The world is Mark. The world is the church, is the house of Israel, the sleeping church. For if the casting away of them, Judah, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the recovering of them, Judah, be but life from the dead. You see, guys, this is their promise. This is their promise that they would receive life from the dead. So when you when you hear this type of teaching that 1 Corinthians 15, and somebody wants to say, hey, 1 Corinthians 15 is clearly talking about the last trumpet and being raised from the dead, which is for those for the millennial reign, it's exactly correct. When they want to tell you, hey, it's Matthew 24, that Matthew 24 and 1 Corinthians 15 are clearly post-trib, they're correct. They're correct. You see, all we have to do to see this even more clearly is go to Revelation chapter 20, and you see that the first ones to be resurrected are those who put their necks on the line during the time of seals. There's a group of workers that are chosen during the time of seals that are part of the houses of the Lord, right? That are part of the tribes, I should say. And they're the ones, having put their necks on the line during seals, that are going to be raised from the dead. And they're going to have their part with Daniel and Abraham and all those that are sitting in their plot or waiting in that place for the resurrection of the dead because it was their promise. <clears throat> you see, we are living in Matthew's period of 7,000 years. We are living in Matthew's portion of time in all of human history from in the beginning. We're living in the thousands of years from Adam 
This is the period we're living in. And this portion of time is Matthew's seven years or 7,000 years in this case. And the promise of the resurrection from the dead was for them. You see, you can go into the book of Hosea. We have a lot of teachings on this. The book of Hosea, you'll notice, has 14 chapters. Well, Hosea, we know from Romans 8 or 9, is written to the Gentiles. Well, that's the entirety of the Gentiles, the pre-trib, bride, the the mid-trib rapture group, okay, the house of Israel, and Zechariah is written to the to the Jews. And you're going to see, we're going to show more things on it as well, but these are the only two books, one written to the Gentiles, one written to the Jews, the only two books with seven and seven, 14 chapters. And when you come to Hosea, you see in chapter six, listen to what it says. Starting in uh, verse, uh, verse one and two. Come and let us return unto the Lord, For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days. Remember, it's two days to the Lord, but it would be 2,000 years to us. After two days, will he revive us? And in the third day, 3,000 years. Three to the Lord, 3,000 to us. And in the third day, He will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. What is this conversation all about? It's the exact same thing back here in Revelation chapter 20. Those that are going to be raised from the dead. And what does it say? And upon uh, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You see that? There... After two days, there's this group resurrected who put their necks on the line. And then what? The third day, it's after the thousand year, the millennial reign, when the thousand years is over, which is the 7,000 years from Adam. When that is over, the 3,000th year from Christ and the 7,000th year in the bigger picture of it is over, that's when the rest of them will be raised. It is right there in Hosea chapter 6. Those that will be raised are those who were given the promise of the millennial reign. It has nothing to do with Luke's group. It has nothing to do with Mark's group in the sleeping church. It is all for Matthew's group. It's incredible. And now this is going to lead us into even deeper revelation. Things that are just going to make you say, what? Watch this. Here's a fun one to get us started. When you look up the phrase kingdom of God, the few times, just a handful of times you see it in Matthew, it's always in a relation to Something that's not theirs, that it was for them. Like you read here in Matthew 21, 43. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And then what do you see? All filled in Mark's gospel and all filled in Luke's gospel. Okay, we're talking about the synoptic gospels. Look at that. Oh, look at this. Kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. That was just Luke. Kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, 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 kingdom of God. And then to tell them in Matthew that it's not for them. Now, why does this matter? Because this is another one of those things 
that gets mixed up in church teachings sometimes you'll hear you'll hear pastors say the kingdom of god other times you'll see you'll hear them say the kingdom of heaven but the kingdom of heaven brothers and sisters has nothing to do with the gentiles and the church okay it has nothing to do with the house of israel to which the gentiles are grafted in or the bride the kingdom of heaven is the promise to judah is the promise to the jews of their millennial reign the kingdom of heaven on earth you see the the kingdom of god is where the third heaven is is where paradise is a part of the kingdom of heaven is what's going to be on the earth during the millennial reign and it just so happens as you understand these things you'll see the kingdom of heaven in matthew and guess what this is a word search this isn't even a definition of a num of the number this is the actual just saying kingdom of heaven and look at this all of it is matthew it's so only matthew that it's not mentioned in any other piece of scripture except the gospel of matthew you see these little details that make a huge difference in in an example like this i'll show you in uh, in the gospels what this is like if you go to the to the last supper of luke oops if you go to the last supper in luke and mark you see things like uh for the passover you know this preparation for the passover and he shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready okay above ground and it's only used twice you go to mark's upper room for the preparation of passover and you see and he will show you a large upper room there it is again furnished and prepared it's a difference there make ready when you go to matthews you don't have it because these two upper rooms is the third heaven and is paradise and so when you come to matthews you don't get anything of that in matthews it says my time is at hand i will keep the passover at thy house with thy disciples okay and they made ready the passover you have no upper room no additional place that they're being taken to but you see when you hear teachings on this You'll hear some tell you that it was an upper room and you'll have others tell you it was it was just it wasn't really an upper room. It was just a level at the top of where they were with this mountain on, on this hill. And the reason they have to say that is because the Matthew portion is different than Mark and Luke's. It's very different than Mark and Luke's. You see, another place to understand this real quick is in Second Corinthians. This is a very famous one for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is the typology of Christ here. And he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. And this one is, you see, like a rapture. Such an one means like a harpazo. Okay. This is like, this is the pre-trib escape. And they go to the third heaven. And then he says, I knew such a man. Okay. This is like, okay, similar type of man not one directly in christ but kind of and this one is the rapture he was caught up just like we read in revelation 12 5 into paradise both of these are taking away are are catching up are are being brought to a place above and then he goes on to say now the third time i am coming this time i'm coming to you you see this is the matthew reference This is why in Matthew, it wasn't about going to an upper room because it would be here on the earth. It's fascinating seeing these little differences and they make all the difference in the revelation. But now this starts to get a lot heavier. And that's because we're going to see something that is, is one of the reasons 
why I wanted to redo this video and make it more extensive and and show why it's this lens of Matthew that has caused all of this. Because when you see these things and you begin to understand these things, you see this confusion that has been brought about by always having this lens, knowingly or unknowingly, of Matthew. Because when you're looking through this lens of Matthew, you see, you've got the church that's really Mark. There's a little bit of Luke in them, but the majority, 90% is Mark. And they're teaching us all from a lens of Matthew, which is to the Jews. And so when you're teaching, as I said earlier, from this lens of Matthew, you're teaching in this 7,000 year idea that begins from Adam. And what ends up happening is you miss the deeper revelation that this is all about that shows that there was clearly more than one seven year. There was two for the tribulation and that there was clearly more than one 7,000 year and at least two in the creation. That is where this gets so fascinating and so deep. And we've got many other teachings uh, like uh, it's all a fractal or it's a fractal is is a name of a video as we really started seeing this as the spirit revealed these things to us through all of this revelation of 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 ending this this focused lens from Matthew and seeing that there are three groups in Luke, Mark and Matthew that are being spoken to in all of scripture. Now this is why this is so important and why I'm reiterating that portion again, <clears throat> because in ancient Judaism, okay, let's start right here. What set the followers of Jesus apart from other Jews was their faith in Jesus as the resurrected Messiah. While ancient Judaism acknowledged multiple messiahs. Now that sounds blasphemous at first until you understand what i'm about to share the two most relevant okay the two most relevant being messiah ben joseph and the traditional messiah ben david christianity acknowledges one ultimate messiah now this is where as I said, some people are going to start shaking their heads that haven't understood these things before. And why I say it's this continuation as you, as you begin to understand the first and the second portion and you get into these deeper things. Seek the Lord in prayer. Seek the Spirit to, to open your eyes, to open your ears, to, to circumcise your heart, to receive the truth of the revelation. You see, they have acknowledged in ancient Judaism, that there are two messiahs. One is Messiah from Joseph, and one is Messiah of David. But in Christianity, there's one ultimate Messiah. And this is where it gets so awesome. Because what you're about to understand is that, yes, there is one ultimate Messiah. But he comes in two forms he came first as the son of joseph and that lineage but the jews the reason the the probably the number one reason that the jews have not fully acknowledged christ the, as, as from the son of joseph portion is for two reasons <laughs> one very important one and that is because they were blinded. Remember, we were reading that in, uh, in Romans 11. We know they were blinded. And who even said it? Watch this. Look at who said that they would be blinded. Let's go to Romans 11. Okay. Look at what he says. Remember? Uh, where was it? I'm sure it was Romans 11. Oh, it's further up. Remember this? And David saith, let their table be made a snare 
and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see. See that? Their eyes are darkened so they cannot see. Okay? They were made to slumber that their eyes should not see and their ears should not hear unto this day, meaning even right now as we're speaking. This is one very important piece. And who's it connected to? What David said. What David said. You see? Very important things. We see here in the Orthodox view. Okay, so in the ancient in the ancient views, they say that the generally hell is generally held that the Messiah will be a uh, a patrilineal descendant of King David, and will gather Jews back into the land of Israel, usher in an era of peace, and build the the third temple. Well, hold on a second. First of all, they're saying from the descendant of David. And they're saying when he comes, he's going to gather them back into the land. You see, what Jews look at this and say is they say, yeah, 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 we're back in the land. But when the the true Messiah comes, he will gather the rest of them, you know, like New York and and South America and, and wherever. He'll gather the rest of them back into the land. And he's going to rebuild the third temple. But what they failed to understand is that that's not what this was only saying. They need to be removed from the land first. That is something that the Jews have not yet grasped. And we're going to get into that a little bit more here in a moment. I want to finish up first with this part with with David compared to Joseph. Okay? Okay. And this this about being blind for them. You see, if we go to Isaiah 6, uh, Isaiah 6, we were recently talking about this in other videos. Listen to this in Isaiah 6. It's all about that blindness. Okay? Isaiah 6, starting in verse 8. Then, I'm sorry, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for me? Then said I, here I am, send me. We all know this is a typology of Christ, right? This is the typology of Christ that said, send me, I'll go. Listen to what it says. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes. Lest, meaning unless, they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. <laughs> we, we had a video on this recently. And you would think, uh, that sounds like the complete opposite of what the Lord wants. But he was sent to blind them. They were blinded so that the Gentiles, the house of Israel, the world, could come in. And their last portion of time is to the end of seals. You see, they're being blinded, but they will see again. You remember when Christ was here, we'll come back to this and finish it in a second. You remember in Luke chapter 19, where Christ is coming into Jerusalem after the triumphal entry. And only in Luke do you find this, which is the typology of when he comes as the son of man for 40 days as the tribulation begins. (laughs) You'll understand that when, when you finish this and you dig deeper and you watch more of those intro videos. He says, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. If that and saying, if thou had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. You see, they were blinded. For the days shall come upon thee 
when that enemy shall cast the trench about you see this is this is the luke discourse when they're going to be compassed about it's the same typology shall cast the trench about thee and shall compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall say and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation this is the conversation that's going on in luke's discourse which i said is that 40 to 50 day portion of time now when we go back to isaiah 6 and we see this conversation when the lord being the one that said send me and that he's to blind them just as we saw there what do we read next then said i lord how long and he answered until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate and the lord have removed men far away and there be great forsaking in the midst of the land you see this is the same conversation we saw in luke chapter 19 and it is the same conversation in relation to the end of days and what has happened is the jews have not understood that this gathering back into the land by the messiah of the david lineage that they're looking for who's the one who will bring them back from the corners of the earth who will be the one to oversee this third temple they have misunderstood <coughs> or maybe refused to believe in their in their pride and in their arrogance have refused to believe that they're about to be removed from the land again and and why would they think they're not going to be removed because in a seven-year vision in a matthew focus that the christian church has and teaches sure israel might be attacked but they're not going to be so attacked that they're going to be removed from the land for years they believe it's going to be a short-lived attack and that at this short-lived attack a declaration of peace will be made and they think it will be the rebuilding of the third temple they think that when this begins it's going to be this messiah david who's about to bring this about but you see the jews fall for that and believe that because they're listening to the pastors in the christian churches who are telling them that this tribulation period of time is only going to be seven years and it will begin with the rebuilding of the third temple and then the christians say but you're going to fall for this guy you're going to fall for the wrong guy but this is where it all falls apart in the revelation they have not understood that there is a seven years that comes first that that the messiah that came first was the messiah was the messiah that john chapter one spoke about okay in chapter john chapter one verse 45 it says philip findeth nathaniel and saith unto him we have found him of whom moses in the law and the prophets did write jesus of nazareth the son of joseph you see remember what this was saying the christians acknowledge him as the ultimate messiah you see he is he was when he came as this as this lowly man as this humble man right as as the son of man in the flesh in the way he came humbly as he did this was not the messiah the jews are waiting for 
the Jews are waiting for their Messiah who will gather them back into the land from the four corners of the earth and will rebuild in a period of peace the third temple. But the Christians are telling them that when this happens, at the beginning of the seven years, they're going to fall for this Antichrist character. It's absolutely not true. Because they've seen only seven years and they've convoluted it and twisted it as they did this all pre mid and post. Because there is a Messiah Ben David coming as well. You see, listen to what Matthew chapter 1 says. The book of the generation of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see, we know that he is the lineage of David. But the Jews are specifically looking from the one that is as the ruler as David was. The one that will build this temple. You see, and the Christians at the same time will say, we are the temple of God. Because in this time of the Gentile age, of of the house of Israel age, it is us that are the temple of God. But when the age of the Gentiles comes to an end, When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, in that seventh year of seals, it will return to as it was to the time of the Jews. And it will be a physical temple being built. You see, look at even in Hosea chapter 3. Again, Hosea, this is like into seals now. And listen what it says. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king. And and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. Afterward, shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, comma, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. In the latter days. And what is it saying? David, their king. You'll hear this from Jews all the time because they think David is either going to be resurrected and David is going to be the one coming back. But it's not that David is coming back. It's that Messiah Christ was both the Messiah who came for the house of Israel who came for the world while the Jews waiting for this Messiah, David, who comes with power and victory and defeating the enemies, who will oversee this rebuilding of the third temple, they were blinded until this time. They're blinded until the seals come to an end and the fullness of the Gentiles has come in as and through the Messiah ben Joseph. Then it will come to the time of Messiah ben David. This is who the Jews have been waiting for. Do you understand? (coughs) This is why the Jews, as we've shown before, (coughs) the Jews know through all of these scriptures, all throughout the Old Testament, there's a whole bunch of things that haven't been fulfilled. If Christ was the Messiah they were looking for, then why didn't the temple get rebuilt? Well, first of all, it doesn't make any sense because the temple was already there. Why did he suffer on the cross and die and resurrect? Yet to them, he never rebuilt the temple because it was already there. He never destroyed all the enemies that came against them because then the 30 some years later, the temple was destroyed and all their enemies scattered them from the land. So all of these prophecies that they were looking for with their Messiah, Ben David, never happened. This is why they haven't accepted Christ the Messiah yet, as the world has come to know him. Because when he came as Messiah, Ben Joseph, he came for the world. Of which some Jews also entered because we know they were blinded in part, not 100%. Okay, we've shared on this before. You see, 
what are what are Jews waiting for? Right from this Jewish website, just like we shared a little while ago, the messianic era era will be ushered in by a Jewish leader referred to as the Moshiach or Messiah in Hebrew, the anointed one, a righteous Zion of King David. He will rebuild the holy temple in Jerusalem and gather the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth into the promised land. They didn't just make this up. They know this from scripture. And this is why Christians and Jews are always bumping heads. But you see, the Christians in a seven-year Matthew focus are understanding and encouraging Jews in that same seven-year focus to let them know, hey, when we're out of here, they're going to be they're going to make a peace deal and they're going to start rebuilding the temple. And so what are the Jews doing at the same time? Every year or two years, they suddenly say, hey, we've got somebody from the lineage of David. He is the anointed one king from King David. He is our Moshiach, the anointed one. But there are only one real Moshiach. There's only one true anointed one that they're waiting for. And you see, when you understand these things, you understand that those two messiahs that they're talking about is really the same messiah. But the first one came for the house of Israel. That was his creation. That was that was his. That was the world. That was his Rachel. And that the house of Judah is the one when he comes as king in power and authority and gathers them back. You see, when you see this with the anointed one, now when you get to Daniel, excuse me, when we get to... Um, when we get to Daniel chapter 9, we see this portion right here, starting in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, again, they should know that there's an attack that's coming first. But because the Christians have told them, all the pastors, and they believe that they're about to rebuild, they think this is coming first. And that only a small attack, oh, it might be devastating to an extent, but that they will still remain in the land and start to rebuild. But it's not true. Not yet. Because, you see, it says that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. You see, this is that anointed one that they that they expect to start rebuilding to. This is that Messiah Ben David, the true anointed one shall be seven weeks. And this very important piece of scripture that we've been teaching a lot about over the last four years or three and a half years, comma, and, meaning they're separate, but are added together. And what the church has done and what Jews have done is this seven weeks, they say that this seven weeks is simply this seven weeks being explained it is not this is the seven weeks for which the jews must be removed from jerusalem just as we read what did what did isaiah say what did luke 19 say what were all of these things saying that they must the the land they're going to be destroyed and they're going to be removed from the land why is this happening? It's happening for the disobedience, remember? Isaiah chapter 26, I'm uh, sorry, Leviticus chapter 26. What was it all about? When it said, I will scatter you, starting in verse 33, I will scatter you among the heathen and I will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. There's the same story again. Why? Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. 
as long as it lieth desolate it shall rest because it did not rest in your sabbaths when you dwelt upon it what's it talking about jerusalem so they've had jerusalem just a little over 50 years now they have not allowed the sabbaths of rest so in the seven times seven the land has not rested in jerusalem so let's go a little bit further and see what it says starting in verse 41 and that i also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies if there's uncircumcised hearts be humbled and then they accept uh and then accept of the punishment of their iniquity i will remember my covenant with jacob and also my covenant with isaac and also my covenant with abraham and i will remember and i will remember the land the land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her sabbaths which lieth desolate without them and they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes and yet for all that when ye when they be in the land of their enemies i will not cast them away neither will i arbor them uh, abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them for i am the lord their god but i will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors who brought them forth out of the land of egypt in the sight of the heathen that i may be their god i am the lord how long are they being removed from the land for seven years these are the same seven years as the seven weeks being spoken about in daniel chapter 9. so you see the jews that have been blinded are unaware in this blindness that they're about to be removed from the land for seven years because the lord cannot rebuild on that land because it's been defiled in the 50 plus years that they've had it in its sabbaths so because the christians in a matthew lens are looking at a jewish portion of time of seven years they think that this is about to begin they think that it's going to start with this with this short devastation which it will and then they think this commandment to restore is going to bring about the building but it's not this first attack is only the beginning then comes a greater attack and we know world war three will break out and this period of time will end when the seven years of seals are over when the seven years of seals are over then you have the three score in two weeks the about three and a half years where the street shall be rebuilt again and the wall even in troublous times as well as the temple and it says and after these three score and two weeks or about two and uh, three and a half years messiah shall be cut off okay we've gone into these things this is the first three and a half of trumpets and then you've got the two and a half years when the pit is opened and then this is that final year of trumpets that we spoke about when messiah returns feet down on the mount of olives so you see because the church has not understood that there's a seven-year portion for them and because the jews are the jews and are only seeing one portion everybody thinks that this all means just one seven-week period and the jews don't want to accept that they're about to be wiped out of the land for seven years they're too proud they're too they think they're too mighty that they're going to be removed so the prayer is that they're going to heed the warning of the son of man when he comes and that whether in captivity or whether in the wilderness they will repent and turn to him they will cry out to the lord in forgiveness and would be revealed 
the understanding of the season and time they're in. That once this time is over, their Messiah anointed one, their King David that they're looking for, will now come in that seventh year of seals as the anointed one, as the Zion of King David. And he will rebuild the third temple and will gather the people from the four corners of the earth. You see, it's all of this distraction, all of this mix-up was because they've all only seen seven years. You see, we've talked about Zechariah 8 many times. Zechariah 8 is a beautiful piece of scripture because this is where the Jews say, hey, you see, we read something like this and this is the Messiah we're waiting for. It says, thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Okay. You go down further and it says, um, and I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. In fact, here, let's go up a little bit. Verse seven, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. You that hear in these days the words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For before these days there was no man for hire, nor any beast. For neither was there peace to him that went came went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set every man against his neighbor. You see? Then look at what it says down here. Verse 19. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fifth month and the seventh and the tenth shall be unto the house of Judah, joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth and peace. You following? How about when we get to Zechariah 14? In Zechariah 14, look at what we see. It's the beginning of Zechariah 14. And he says, I will gather all nations to battle. Okay? He's going to fight as when he did at the end of seals. Because what happened at the end of seals? When he came as King David, right? When he comes as king, when he comes as the the anointed king from the lineage of David that the Jews were waiting for, that the house of Judah has been waiting for. He came as a conquering king against all the enemies that came against the against the, the world, essentially, and against the against Israel. And he defeated them. And he's going to declare that peace as we've shown in the seventh seal, in the seventh seal. And then there's going to be this portion of time. So now what you get, what happens is when you get to Zechariah chapter 8, where are we now? Well, when you get to Zechariah chapter 8, you've now completed the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark is over. The seals are over. The portion to the church is over. And now the lens that was seen for Matthew is no longer anything to do with seals because Judah was removed from the land. They were scattered for seven years while tribulation broke out against the whole world, which is the house of Israel. And that was those seven years from Daniel chapter nine. So now when we come to the end of seals and we're at the beginning of the eighth year or we're at the beginning of chapter eight, We're now starting the Gospel of Matthew. Okay? At the Gospel of Matthew, we end up seeing things like this second abomination of desolation. The first one was the mark of the beast. That's the one during the time of Mark, during the time of the church during seals. This one's standing in the holy place because for the first three and a half years of trumpets, the temple was being rebuilt. The city and the streets were being rebuilt. And then 
Satan is cast down. The pit is opened and they have to flee. They go into the wilderness for the time and times and half a time. And that will take them into a place of protection until not only the two and a half years of Satan is done, are done, but also to the end of the final of the final three and a half years of trumpets, once the final year of the Lord has dealt with them all in that final year, which was just as we showed earlier, the days of Noah. That final 14th year, which is Zechariah 14, when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives, and there's a war, a battle that takes place for all those who had come against Jerusalem. When this plague breaks out and their eyes are consumed in their sockets and the tongue melts in their mouth and all this craziness, this is the Lord when he's seen coming on a cloud, as Matthew said. You following? These are the types of things that when you understand, when you see these things, it just blows you away. You see, so now what happens? Well, if the temple was being rebuilt and then Messiah is cut off because Satan's been cast down, then when it's all over and the Lord returns, Okay, Satan had gone in and destroyed some of the temple and declared himself God and, and wreaked havoc for two and a half years. Look at what happens in Amos 9 at the end of it all. It says, in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David. Why not the tabernacle of Joseph, you see? The tabernacle of David that is fallen and will close up the breaches thereof, which means it was already rebuilt. Now they're just repairing it beautifully repairing it and i will raise up his ruins and i will build it as it was in the days of old we come down here uh oh let's keep going verse 12 that they may possess the remnant of edom and all uh and of all the heathen which are called by my name saith the lord that doeth this behold the days come saith the lord that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel. See, this is his captivity, the good captivity. And they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. See, this isn't this isn't the beginning of trumpets. This is when trumpets has now come to an end, because when Satan was cast out, more destruction came again. And they shall plant vineyards. And drink wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no longer, no more, be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Okay, over and over and over again. Look at this again with David. It says, and you can read this in each of the Gospels, because we know. That Messiah Joseph and Messiah ben, uh, David are actually the same while the Jews are saying that they're two separate. Okay? So one was for the world and some of the Jews jump, were able to come in that weren't blinded. And the other one when he comes is this defeating, conquering, temple rebuilding that the Jews have been waiting for, that the house of Judah has been waiting for. But both are... Christ, the Lord and Savior. Listen to what Jesus says. You find this in all the in the three gospels, maybe four. And uh, this is from Luke chapter 20, starting in verse 41. And he said unto them, How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord, all uppercase, said unto my Lord, lowercase except for the uppercase L, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is, this is a real fun one, because what you realize is this is from Psalms 110, and I'm going to show it to you here in uh, Esword, because you'll see the wording difference much more clearly. And this is, what he's, this is what Jesus is talking about from Luke 20. In Psalms 110, verse 1, it says, The Lord, all uppercase, this is the Father, 
said unto my Lord, only uppercase L because this is Christ. Sit, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And the Lord, the Father, shall send the rod of Zion, uh, uh, of thy strength, out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Well, when did we see earlier that he sends out the rod of his strength out of Zion? Well, we saw that that was in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 is at the time of the rapture of the great multitude. The was caught up. So this is clearly the father talking to the son, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. When Mount Zion is going to be here, which is precisely what we saw at the beginning of trumpets that the Jews are waiting for in Zechariah chapter 8, would it be the mountain of the Lord. But look at what he says. He says, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is only found exactly where it should be that the end of seals when he has come on heavenly mount zion should be at the end of the church age should be at the end of the portion of mark the sleeping church the time of the great multitude and it's precisely what we read only in mark's gospel at the end of his gospel at the end of luke's it's different at the end of matthew's it's different We've done videos on these things as well. Listen to what it says. Knowing now and understanding that the end of Mark is what? Right before the seven years begins of Matthew's portion for the house of Judah. Listen to what it says. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So now... This starts to bring up some other questions too, doesn't it? We're, you, should, you should clearly be understanding now that there's two portions of time. That it's this, it's this focus on Matthew that has been given throughout all of church history that has caused these things to be missed and misunderstood and, and jumbled up together. That even when people are seeing things that are mid or seeing things that are post, still unbeknownst to them are trying to serve it up or or are trying to 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 preach it and teach it still within a perspective of seven years because each and every one of them is still have uh, still has a matthew foundation they just simply don't know it it's all going back to matthew it's all going back to this to this unseen perspective of Matthew over and over and over again. You see, because when you start getting into this and you realize these deeper things and you're seeing there's these greater portions of time, okay? The, these greater portions, meaning, meaning you're seeing things like, well, wait a second. If there's a Luke group that goes pre- and then there's a Matthew group that goes at the end of seals in that seventh year of seals. And then the Lord returns when the world will see him feet down. And that's at the, the seventh trumpet. Then it's almost like what? Like the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father. Well, that's exactly right. It's the Holy Spirit over the bride. Those who have the Spirit of God in them. The pre-trib group. The, the troop that's remaining, or the group that's remaining till the end of Mark in that rapture group. That group is the group that he came for, that, that he created in the day's creation. When he created the world and that portion within days. That was his group. You're going to see as we as we start to wrap this up that that the portion that that's Matthew is the creation that the father when when Abraham was made. I mean, not Abraham, when Adam was created or was formed. You see, we're living in Adam's portion of time in God's created Adam time of 7000 years. And so if the first group 
is the Spirit of God with the sons of God, the, the co-heirs. And the second group was, was Christ in light when he created in the days portion. And the third group is this Matthew portion, which is what the, the Lord God, the Father, created with Adam and were in their portion of time. You could see why the Jews believe the whole thing is only 7,000. And their portion of time is Matthew, which is only seven years in the end. But as this begins to separate and you see the different groups of people, you begin to realize and you say, well, if if there's a seven that's at the end of Mark's group, at the end of seals, and it leaves now the seven for Matthew, for the house of Judah, for the Jews, when 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 Messiah ben David comes, still the same Messiah, but but as this conquering king and this rebuilder, then what about in the creation story? Is there is there a mark group in the creation story? <clears throat> and here's the thing: if there's a mark group in the creation story, then what about the father? and the son you see that's one of the the biggest chaotic portions debated in scripture that people will generally believe that christ the son of god is actually his father now we know that everything comes from the father and christ is the beginning of it all so is he his father? He was the word and he was with him? Yes. But do you ever notice that every single person that has had a vision or been taken up to heaven, some people that have been taken multiple times and, and have all these books and stories preached everywhere, that they'll tell you they see Jesus and then the father they can't see. It's just this light, but they could see maybe toes or fingers or something. Every time they tell you about the Father being there and the Son. You see, how do you have Christ able to sit on the right hand of God? You see, is Christ God? Yes, but he's the Lord God lowercase, right? He's the uppercase G, lowercase O-D. The Father is the all uppercase. And again, it depends on the context, like this one right here. You know, see, this is the type of question, like I was saying earlier, near the beginning. It doesn't matter what, what uh, denomination. That's what's torn the church apart, is not understanding these things and the denominations, seeing something different here and seeing something and saying, no, this is that and that is this. It was all caused by not knowing who the Gospels were speaking to. So there's denominations out there who say the son is not the father. When you understand this revelation, they're correct. Jesus is not sitting on the right hand of himself. He didn't tell us to pray to the father and only be like, hey, that's really me. <laughs> You're going to see these things. You're going to understand these things. But the only way to fully understand it is the revelation of the Gospels being seen separately to see the three groups that they're speaking to. Not with a focus in Matthew that causes only seven years to be seen and everything twisted to be seen and put into those seven years. And they've done the same thing going all the way to creation. So because the Jews know, because they're the creation that's the 7,000 we're in right now, then they must understand and know all these things better than we do. Of course, because we're in their 7,000. But it wasn't the only 7,000. And that's what you're going to see. That is part of this fractal revelation. That is the portion of the difference with Luke, Mark, and Matthew. With this particular focus on Mark compared to Matthew. You see? Let's, uh, let me show you another piece right here. In Colossians chapter 1, 
<clears throat> and this will take us to the beginning. Listen to this in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, starting in verse 16. Oh, we can start in verse 1. Uh, sorry, in verse 15. This is a recent find. Who is the image of the invisible God. Okay? Firstborn of every creature. You know what's really awesome about this firstborn of every creature? Check this out in John chapter 1. This is just, this is a mind blower. We have a video on this as well. It's called The Beginning, The Light, The Flesh. See, in the beginning was the Word. So who was the beginning? Christ. So in the beginning was the Word. So the Word was in the beginning. And the Word was Christ, so the beginning was Christ. And then what does it say? And then it talked about him being light. That John wasn't the light, but he was bearing witness to the light. So you have Christ, who's called the beginning, right? The word in the beginning, he is the beginning. And then he's called the light. After he's called the light, we're told that he was made flesh. So he was the beginning, he was the light, and he was made flesh. One, two, three. Okay? You'll see where I'm going with this. Many of you guys know it, but for those watching this as a newer perspective, you're going to see what I'm getting at here when we get into First Corinth, uh, uh, Colossians 1, starting in 15 again. Okay? He's the express image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him all things were created. Check this out. This was a new catch just the other day with a, a post one of our sisters did. And I caught the word by. This word by means in. Remember like in the cloud and on the cloud? Okay. Luke and Mark was about in the cloud. And, and in Matthew, it's when he comes and he's going to be seen uh, on the clouds. Okay. This is that same word in. So in him, for in him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Well, wait a second. Look at this word by. This one was 1722. This one is 1223. This one is for in him were all things created. And this one says, through the channel or act and act of meaning through him now why is that why on earth you see these are not things you can catch if you don't have the strongs at your fingertips that's why a program like eSword which is free is so easy to 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 draw closer you would have never caught this without strongs so what's the difference with for in him, all things were created, and through him were they all created. This brings us into some heavier stuff, which brings us back, as I told you, all the way to Genesis 1. I told you, it would go from the end of the book in Revelation as we were in, and it will bring us all the way back to in the beginning. You see, what was Christ according to John chapter 1? He was in the beginning. I've taught on this many times. The word beginning is the word for first fruits. Who is the first fruits? Christ the Messiah, Resurrection Day. He is the first fruits of the Feast of First Fruits. So in the beginning means in Christ, God created. You see that? In Christ, God created. So you, when you go back to Colossians um, 1, uh, uh, Colossians 1 verse 16, and you say, so in the beginning, God created. So in Christ, God created. So that would be like saying what? Through Christ, God created. So Christ created everything, right? So in him, all was created. But it was also through him because it was from the owner of it all, which was God the Father. So in Christ, God created. So what do we see? The beginning. What did John say was the next form of Christ? The light. 
And what was the third form that John said? He said, flesh. And Adam, we know Christ is a type of what? Last Adam. Some say second Adam or the last Adam. So that would mean he's probably a typology. I'm not saying he was Adam and the one that fell. Okay, I'm not going down that, that rabbit trail. But what I'm sharing with you is that there are three. There are three portions that he created. There was a group in the beginning, which was with the Spirit of God that moved over the face of the waters. This is the group that the Spirit was over. This was the Spirit creation of those who have the Spirit of God. This is the Luke group creation, the same typology as the Gospel of Luke. It's a very short, it's this, it's this gap creation theory that's been out there for hundreds of years. We have the revelation of it here in this ministry. This story right here, this very short two verses, you find more about it in Romans chapter 8 and in other places. Uh, was it? Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> oh, Romans and a bunch of other places. We, we've done videos on it as well. But what you see is this very short period of time. Well, if you recall, when we talked about, um, when I showed this, um, this imagery here with this chapters to years, you don't see anything here about Luke. There's only going to be this short period of time that I was telling you of 40 to 50 days before the seven years and seven years. So what do we see in this creation story over those that have the spirit of God? It's, it's a very fast passing portion of time. And when we go to the story of Jacob and his wives, we see that he's, he's happy to serve for seven years. And he says, they seemed unto him but a few days. Because he was so in love that those first seven years flew by like days. You see? So what is it like? It's like this seven years here. It's not tribulation years, these first seven of Luke. This is what we're in right now. We're in this late stage of this seventh year before the tribulation begins. So the pre-trib is about to take place pretty soon. And so what happens is, see, they flew by. There, there's nothing in here. It flew by like days because it wasn't a portion of tribulation where it was, where it was hard. He was excited to get a bride even though he didn't get the one that he was expecting. You see, why wasn't it the one that he was expecting? Because these are the ones that have the Spirit of God in them. And when you have the Spirit of God, guess what? You're a co-heir with Christ. See, this was the Spirit's portion. Christ then became what? Then God said, let there be light. And Christ was the light. And then we get the creation of first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth, sixth. And what do we see in these days? That there's these males and females. Okay? So we got these creation of days. But what would these days be like? Remember in Hosea chapter 6? Two days and then three days. Right? To the Lord they'd be two days or three days. But to men they would be as thousands of years. So that would mean that these days in this creation portion of the world, which relates to the house of Israel, is this mark portion of time in the big picture going back to creation. So if days are as thousands of years, then these days of creation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which ends at the beginning of chapter two, were in the in the in the realm of time in the in the realm of mankind they would have been as 7000 years that's what hosea was saying but you see it's also what second peter chapter 3 was saying in verse 8 he says but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing i've always said man that's such harsh words to say right be not ignorant of this one thing. 
So does that mean that everybody who doesn't understand this is ignorant? That's not me saying it. I'm reading it. That's what it says. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day, okay? Day one, day two, day three. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So that means in Genesis 1 where it starts the days after the the portion of the Spirit of God, then you have light, which was what John said was the second one, and he was a witness of that light. That began the creation in the days. And the Lord is telling us here that those days would be unto us as thousands of years. That's why Hosea, as we shared earlier, said two days and then the third day. It was really to us 2,000 and then the 3,000th. And it was all from Christ. So this is precisely what is being spoken of in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation of days. So that means this portion that Christ was over as light is this creation that he that he wanted. This was This was the group that was his. This is called the world. This is called the house of Israel. This, this, is, this is the group that, that when Christ came, he said, I came but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see? And so if the creation of the males and females were on the sixth day and the seventh day was rest and we're told in 2 Peter 3, 8 that a day was as a thousand years, then that must mean that this was a thousand years. Which means when we were being taught that the whole story was really only 7,000 years from Adam and that this creation of Adam was the creation of the males and females in Genesis 1 on the sixth day, then that must mean this portion was a thousand years. The sixth day was a day to the Lord, but would be a thousand years to man. Which means after this thousand years from Adam, in the second thousand years, should have been a thousand year rest of of everything. But that wasn't the case, was it? Do you follow what I'm saying? If a day is as a thousand, then that means the sixth day when the males and females were created if it was really referring to Adam, then that means that portion of Adam, not only was it the 6,000th, it means that sixth day being the 6,000th, it means the next year, the next day, was the seventh millennium, and that it was a period of rest for a thousand years. But that's not the case. Because from Adam, is the 6,000 coming to an end and then the 7,000th of the millennial reign. But the church has done the same things as the views of Judah. They have taken Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we said at the beginning, and bundled it all into one, looking at it in the is, not understanding that there is one, two, three groups So they've taken it all from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they've applied the same principle of the creation and put all three groups into one portion (coughs) of this 7,000 years. So what what they've done is they say, well, if the Jews understand this and the Jews have been passing it down for thousands of years, then they must understand. It must be correct. But you don't understand is that we're in their 7,000 from Adam. That the other portions of creation were not them. We're not for them. There were three groups in the creation. And John chapter 1 shared it with us. The beginning, the light, and the flesh just like Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. The beginning, the light, and then flesh. 
Do you see what's happening here? When you step away from this lens of Matthew, you realize that there is not one group bundled into one view, but there are three groups that you're trying to see within this one group. Because even though we're in the 7,000 years of Matthew's portion of time, all three groups are still in it. Throughout all of history, there have been all three groups within it. You see, let's go back and finish this second Peter chapter three. Let's see the rest of it, right? Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So as we said, those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in that creation portion by the light, by the second form of Christ as light, those days would be unto us as a thousand years, comma, and a separate portion of time, but added to the total, says, and a thousand years as a day. Well, when we get to the creation of Adam, we're now in the years of thousands count. When we were in the first portion of chapter one, we were in the days count. So the days are as thousands, and now we're living from Adam in the thousands that are to the Lord as days. So what does that equal? Seven days and 7,000. Or you could say 7,000 to man and the thousands that we're in are as seven days to the Lord. So in total, you have seven days to the Lord and seven days to the Lord. But to mankind in the dimension of time, it was 7,000 years and 7,000 years, which brings it all the way back to the revelation of the end of days that Mark's discourse and Mark's portion of time and the reason for his discourse being changed and having different wording than Matthew's is the seven years of seals for the sleeping church. In that seventh year, is that great multitude rapture. And then comes the final seven for Matthew's group, which is the final seven of trumpets. And the reason for the difference in his discourse, brothers and sisters, this is the revelation, the revelation. This is the opening of the book from Genesis to the Revelation. It is the truth of 777, a fast passing seven to the escape of the bride of Christ. The the ones that have the spirit of God, the ones that are the co-heirs and the pre-trib going to the third heaven. The Mark group, the sleeping church majority of the church that will be left to wake up during the time of seals and be taken in the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals and the end of the church age. To then begin the beginning of the Davidic line of the son of man of Messiah ben David coming as Messiah again, this time in the clouds on Mount Zion as king, making peace and rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple during that portion of the seven years of Judah's Matthew seven years of trumpets. During both, of course, there is the Antichrist and the false prophet during seals. Then it's Satan cast down, the false prophet still there, and the Antichrist brought back. When you understand these things, you end up getting these final little pieces, like Revelation 16, when it tells us 
in verse 13 and i saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet if the dragon and the beast being the 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 satan and the antichrist if they were one how is it there are three seen with three unclean spirits one coming out of each you see brothers and sisters it's because the portions of time the antichrist is against christ's group the mark group and satan is against god's people the matthew group when you understand the separation the differences and the reason for who the gospels are speaking to everything opens up all the way back to creation and you realize that there is the spirit the son and the father that they are working together in perfect harmony but that they indeed are three you see that all of creation is seven 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 and one that the truth is the revelation is the story of jacob seven fast passing years seven more years to serve for rachel six for the cattle that brings them to the end of 20 years and then the 21st year that final jubilee that final restoration that in the big picture of all of creation equals the the large fractal of the millennial reign which will be the end of 22 or 21,000 years and when it's all over and it's the the final jubilee of everything it's not only the jubilee at the during the millennial reign in the big picture of everything the 22nd thousandth year will be the beginning of eternity with the new heavens and the new earth together with our lord and savior and father and spirit and all of our brothers and sisters in christ throughout eternity forever and it will be the new beginning of all of it brothers and sisters I pray with all my heart this has blessed you, that you receive this, that you understand this. You see, because this is an exciting time. Because I'm going to share with you this one last thing. You see, for all those that believe in a seven-year tribulation, yet have been telling you the tribulation is about to begin and the rapture is about to happen, what you should always ask them and they don't like this when you understand the truth of the 14 years if you start by asking them what year do you think jesus crucified and resurrected it 90 percent plus will probably tell you 33 a.d probably like april 3rd 33 a.d and so if christ is coming back 2000 years later which is to fulfill 6000 years and then the millennial reign then 2,000 years must be at least 2033. But what did we see in Hosea 6? He said, after two days. So not at two days, not at the 2,000 years, but after 2,000 years. So really, this should even be 2034. Okay? That's, That's at the very least. So 2033, 2034, okay? We'll be generous and we'll say exactly at 2033, which is 2,000 years later, if it was actually right at 33 AD. And that's what they would have told you. So then you say, okay, let's minus seven years from 33, from 2033, and it wouldn't be till 2026. So anybody who who's looking for a pre-trib rapture of the church who believes in seven years yet knows it's 2,000 years before the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, at the very least, the best case scenario is the tribulation won't begin till sometime in 2026. 
Now, if you want, go ahead and keep believing that. Be ready and watching and and think about it coming in several more years. I'm here to tell you right now that the truth is 14 years. It is two sets of seven. It will begin with the escape of the bride of Christ, a 40 to 50 day portion, then the 14 years beginning, seven of seals, in which in the seventh year, the rapture of the great multitude will happen, which is called the mid-trib, but not three and a half years as everybody's been taught. It will be in the seventh year of seals. The Lord will be there on heavenly Mount Zion. The city and the streets will be rebuilt as the Jews had expected, as this conquering Messiah has come. And the city and the streets during a time of peace and the temple will be rebuilt. And it'll be a period with the enemies along the way and the battles and the wars along the way. But then when it's all over and he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, it will be the end of the sixth year of trumpets, the 13 years of tribulation. He will wipe out all the enemies that attacked, bind Satan for a thousand years. And then it will be the millennial reign, the jubilee and the millennial reign will begin. Wouldn't you much rather believe that and understand that for those that aren't a part of the pre-trib, that there's still great news even amongst the chaos that will come? That the Lord will protect and watch over those who commit and devote themselves to him? That there's still this portion of time of a great multitude rapture coming for them? Wouldn't you rather have something like that for people who are left behind to understand? Wouldn't you rather be earlier than in several more years from now? Do you actually think that with everything taking place in the world right now, that we're going to 26, 27, 2028 before it actually begins? Absolutely not. Because the truth of the revelation is who the gospels are speaking to in the 14 years. And all of this was because we have misunderstood because the entirety of the church has been teaching with a lens of is and has put everything together from the gospel of Matthew and has missed the understanding of who Luke and Mark in the synoptic gospels are speaking to. It not only reveals this is to come portion of time, but it opens up and reveals the beginning of all creation, the spirit group in the beginning, the son of man group, the the Christ group in light in the second portion, and the flesh in the third portion, the bride, Luke, the mark, the great multitude rapture, and the Lord's return, feet down on the Mount of Olives for the house of Judah. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray this unlocks your spirit, your mind. It opens your eyes and your your ears and that the spirit is working on you right now. This is a blockbuster one. Share it, share it, share it, and let them know this must be watched first. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.